Hello and welcome to Module 7 of the class on Genomic Selection. In this module we'll be talking about the genomic selection schemes that can be implemented in plant breeding. There's two basic schemes to utilize genomic selection. The first one is selection among individual plants based solely on their genotype in what can be termed a rapid cycling genomic selection scheme. You can also use gen genomic selection as a tool to assist with selection of lines to advance the next stage of next stage of selection, next stages of evaluation in your field trials. These two approaches are not exclusive. You can do both and combine them together. And there's really many ways to execute either scheme. It all depends on your resources, your goals, your skill set, and your creativity. So you think about these things, you think about your program, you come up with a scheme to fit your needs. Here is just the basic outline of a general rapid cycling genomic selection scheme. Of course, always starts with your training population, as we've discussed. You use the data from that training population, develop the models. You cross the best, get F1s. The F1s can be self to get F2s. The F2s are genotyped. You predict their value, cross the best F2s, and start over again. And this right down here is a cycle of genomic selection. And this can be completed in two cycles, two, two seasons, I'm sorry. So one cycle of selection can be completed in two seasons. So that's why we call it a rapid cycle method. And this just shows the same thing diagrammatically. And again, here is a season one and season two. You complete those you've completed one cycle of genomic selection. Seasons three and four, you do the same thing, so you've completed the second cycle. There's many considerations when you're trying to set up a rapid cycling genomic selection scheme. You must consider your population size, the generation time of your crop, the, generation, the amount of time it's going to take to go through a season, uh, through a cycle of selection. How many seasons will that be? It's shorter with F2s than it is with F3s or F4s. You can consider using off-season nurseries instead of your own location, using greenhouses. You know, of course, you always have to consider the, the uh, amount of market data you're going to need and the cost and the time to get the market data back. And this, last, this point here is not trivial. If you're working with a crop that from the time you plant to the seed to the time it flowers, if that period of time is only two months, then you must isolate your DNA, send it to the lab, get your market data back, and get it analyzed to predict the value of all those plants before they flower. That all has to be completed in that this example in a two-month period. You always have to consider cost, genetic variation that you'll have in this population that you're generating through the rapid cycling, your gain from selection, and the uh, stability of your linkage stasis equilibrium in these populations. So what individuals might you genotype in a rapid cycling scheme? Well, you can always start with the easiest thing is F2s. They're easy, they're quick, but there are some disadvantages to them. First of all, F2s are highly heterozygous, and the heterozygotes can sometimes be difficult to score in some species in some genotyping systems. Uh, in an F2 population, there's less genetic variance than you're getting an F3 or an F4 population. But you can take the F2s. You can self them if they're not stable or homogeneous. And so those F2-3 families, F2 derived families, can go out to the field. And <clears throat> the fact that those F2-3 families are still segregating actually can facilitate pedigree selection within desirable F2-3s. And we'll show an example of that later. And these segregating families can actually be quite useful in participatory plant breeding. The next type of individuals you can look at, F3s, F4, in other words, just more highly inbred individuals. Each generation adds, adds an extra season and therefore lengthens the duration of a cycle of genomic selection. But each uh, generation of inbreeding also increases your genetic variance, the homozygosity, and the stability of the derived lines. So there's some real advantages there. Next, you can consider using double haploids. Undoubtedly, double haploids are probably the best material for genomic selection. Completely homozygous, you maximize your genetic variation. In fact, your genetic variation in double haploid population will be twice that that you would find among X2, F2s, and of course the lines are stable. 
but this can be costly. In my uh, my experience, the cost of generating a double haploid is just about the same as the cost of genotyping it. So you have to have considerable amount of financial resources to generate the double haploids and then genotyping. And this can also lengthen uh, the duration of a breeding cycle. It depends how quickly you can get double haploids back from the double haploid uh, supplier. You can also do genomic selection based on F1s. And here, you know, when we go through this rapid cycling, as I showed in the previous slide, the F1s are generated by crossing F2s. So here, what we call F1s is actually a heterogeneous population. So those plants could be genotyped, predict their value, and pick the best ones to be used uh, for either selfing or crossing amongst themselves. And of course, in some crops, particularly clonal crops, um, that in crops that do not tolerate inbreeding, the F1s are always a heterogeneous population and you can do selection amongst them. So here's just an example of what I was talking about with uh, selecting amongst F3 individuals derived from F2s. This is basically nothing more than pedigree selection, but it's based on estimating on genomic estimating breeding values. So here up here, uh, each one of these green lines represents a different F2 plant. And right here below each plant is their estimated breeding value based on genomic selection. So if we want to increase the trait, these two plants here have the most desirable scores. Of course, we would cross amongst them to start the next cycle. But each of these plants can also be selfed, generating an F2-3 family. Now, if your additive genetic variance amongst F2s is 3.4, then the variation within each of these families would be estimated to be half of that, or 1.7. But the mean of these individuals, of these F3, should be the same as the breeding value of that individual plant. So some of these plants are, have breeding values that are greater than the mean, and of course some of them have breeding values that are less than the mean. Anyways, this is still a segregating population, and you can use the same genomic selection model to pick the best F3s from these highly desirable families. We have looked at this in our My Breeding program, and here's a, an F2 generation from the third cycle of genomic selection, and its average yield in a one location, Worcester, Ohio. The average breeding value of those individuals, those F2s, was 3.33, but if I looked at F3 individuals derived from the best cycle 2 F2s, their average breeding value was almost 4, which is 19% greater than what I have there. So anyways, these F2 derived families, you pick the ones with the best and most desirable breeding values, you can do better pedigree selection within them by getting their DNA and estimating their breeding values. To do rapid cycling, it does take uh, a, a high degree of management. You have to, of course, maintain your seeds, plants, identify samples, DNA samples. You got your FASTQ files, your genotype files, parents, resulting crosses, F2 individuals, sometimes inbred progeny from the F2s, selections from within the F2. So there's a lot of information here that needs to be managed. Lots of tracking information, data, and identities. And this just shows a picture here of uh, probably about a thousand F2 plants that are all staked, identified, have been genotyped, and will be selected amongst using genomic selection. And again, just information from my program. We started out with a training population of 470 lines. 16 of them were selected and used as parents. We made 71 crosses amongst them. Selfed the F1s from those crosses. We had 922 F2 plants. Each one was genotyped. We predicted their values. We selected 78 of them and made crosses amongst them. It's just coincidental that we have ended up making 78 crosses among the 78 parents. From those, we got F1s, selfed them, and we got 1,003 F2 plants that were then genotyped. We predicted their value, selected 98 that had the most desirable traits, and again, it's just a coincidence that we ended up also getting 98 crosses amongst the 98 parents. And from there, of course, we got the F1, selfed them, 
end up with 1,500 F2 and F3 plants. They're all genotyped, and on we go. As in most aspects of plant breeding, a larger population is always better than a smaller population. But obviously, just like in your field trials, there are constraints of space and funding to, uh, that you can allocate to the, um, selecting amongst these plants. In summary, using rapid cycling as uh, the best way to obtain your improved gains per year or per season. You can genotype F2s, F3s, double haploids, even F1s. Each has advantages and disadvantages. And there's many issues to consider and logistics to consider when setting up a rapid cycling program. Here is a quiz for the first unit in Module 7. And you can take this quiz if you wish. And if you want to know how you did on it, you can send me your answers and I'll take a look at them. Now we'll continue on to the second module in Unit 7.